Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for joining me here today. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is very much a work in progress. So if anyone has any feedback or would like to chat to me or interrogate me, please feel free. Um, so my overall work is looking at exploring race and slavery in the early Encyclopedia Britannica, which I'm going to abbreviate to EB from now on because it's a mouthful. Um, so my research examines the first eight editions of EB, which covers the period from 1768 till 1860. Um, this makes up 35 volumes, which totals 109,393 pages, which is an enormous task um, to look through. Um, so, as many of you might know, EB was a reference publication, drawing together knowledge of science and arts, and the editions that I'm examining um, were published at the height of the transatlantic slave trade and increasing public discourse in Britain on the abolition of slavery and the slave trade. Obviously, there were other discussions happening elsewhere as well, but I think it's especially important to note that it was published in Britain, so it might be more reflective of discussions happening in Britain at the time. So, as I said, my research is quite exploratory in how we can approach and analyze EB thematically to explore race and slavery by using text analysis. So I'm hoping to interrogate our understanding or what we think our understanding is of slavery through the editions, um, essentially seeking to answer the following questions. What changes over time? Which phrases and terms appear or do not appear through the editions? Crucially, how does usage of certain words change over the editions and how can we deduce any meaning from this? And how are articles that reference slavery related? Where are the knowledge um, networks made? Where is knowledge expressed about race and slavery? And how is it connected through each edition and across editions? So in seeking to address these, qu these questions, a quote from intellectual historian Jeff Loveland uh, springs to mind speaking on studying encyclopedias, where he says, um, computer's ability to recognize and interpret patterns of text remains limited. People in this room might take issue with that. Um, so as the increasing number of projects using computa computational methods to investigate encyclopedias and in the wider DH field broadly demonstrates, there are ways to use digital methods um, on text at scale and Loveland's statement honestly sounds like a challenge for over 100,000 pages of text, which is what I'm trying to do. So as I mentioned, my research is in collaboration with the National Library of Scotland and their EB data set, which is available through the Data Foundry. Um, and this provides the basis of my research. However, the digitized text files had really high OCR error rates, um, rendering any analysis on that text quite impossible. Um, so there are a large number of unpredictable errors that would be difficult to correct, so I looked into alternatives. So therefore, I used images from the Data Foundry dataset with the handwritten text recognition platform Transcribus to create a high quality machine readable data set with a low character error rate. I'm aware that 2.41 still isn't the lowest character rate it could be, but I'm operating at a level of, there's an acceptable level of loss. Um, there is also an ongoing project by Peter Logan and his team on the 19th Century Knowledge Project mentioned here, um, which is creating high quality cleaned up versions of the third, seventh, ninth, and 11th editions, um, some of which I've accessed and used so far. So in order to address my key questions, I decided to use three main avenues to explore the data. Frequency counts um, from a select list of keywords. Um, this is just to get a sense of patterns over the editions and examining those occurrences of keywords in a context in order to guide closer readings, see what parts of the editions I should be targeting, where information is presented, and where I should be following up on points. I'll also be using network analysis to visualize the connections between the articles. Um, so although, if anyone turned up expecting me to talk about topic modeling, sorry, I'm not doing that. My abstract mentioned it, but I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> um, I felt that these were probably the most achievable ways to conduct the project as I moved through um, and would give me a more focused um, analysis as I moved through. So I think topic modeling with EB would be very valuable, but it's not on my list at the moment. So a really important aspect of my work is recognizing that there are a lot of implicit links being made between articles and ideas that are expressed. Um, so what is not recorded in the written record is equally as important as what explicitly appears. Um, I'm still very much in the data gathering stage um, before I can do deep dive analysis um, at the moment, but I've got some preliminary findings which I'm going to share. Um, the image I've sort of been telling people is I feel like Smaug from The Hobbit sat on the pile of gold and I haven't done anything with the gold yet. Um, so we'll see how that pans out. 
So these frequency counts were created um, working in a collaborative project led by Rosa Filgara using Francis, um, a tool that she designed, um, which is described as an advanced cloud-based text mining digital platform that leverages information extraction, knowledge graphs, natural language processing, deep learning, and parallel processing techniques. So this is a, from a paper that's forthcoming outlining the functionality of Francis and outlining case studies of which I've contributed to. Um, but I really wanted to thank Rosa and Lil and you, or Damon, um, especially for helping to facilitate the collaboration. Um, it's been incredibly valuable um, being able to use tools that someone else has built um, in really close um, collaboration to get some interesting results. So I designed queries based on keywords, loosely based around commodities, places of interest, and terms for groups of people, which did include a lot of racialized language that was present in 18th and 19th century sources, um, which were then run through Francis. So looking at this graph, the peak around 1803 is a bit of an anomaly as it's a supplement to the edition, so it isn't an edition proper. Um, so don't mind that too much, but I think it's important to include and have a look at too. Um, so this example produced in Francis tracks the appearance of commodities and entries in each edition. And as we can see by the purple line, cotton significantly increases in the later half of the period, um, far above most of the other commodities. This is likely due to a significant increase in British advancements in technologies that, the, that were used um, in cotton production and its sort of dissemination more broadly across the world. So these graphs um, are digging a little deeper into occurrences of entries that mention cotton, combining this with specific place names, so only entries where the place name and cotton are both included have been returned in these results. Um, so targeting a few select examples of Caribbean regions and non-Caribbean regions. Um, so we know that cotton was produced in the West Indies, but it was largely, there was a lot of unfortunate unsuccesses um, and unfavorable weather conditions and famines that eventually led to um, basically an abandonment of the production. And the focus was shifted to other areas, which is reflected in the sharp increase in here. So I'm doing a lot more data comparison points and I'm, as I said, still in the data collection process. Um, but this collaboration has helped to come up with a sort of path forward, um, looking at these types of frequencies and extracting data that I can comp compare against, um, I can extract and compare against each other and hopefully draw some more conclusions from. So a little bit on the keywords and context, um, it's a huge volume of data to go through. However, these are some examples of searching the word slaves um, in the first edition, volume one. Um, this is why it's important to look at the context. You might think that 1768, there might be some more discussions happening around um, contemporary slavery. Actually, a lot of the references are to ancient Rome slavery in classical um, settings. Um, so this is obviously a reflection of the sort of obsession with classicism that was quite prevalent in the 18th century. Um, but it's really important to get that indication of what context um, the words are being used in because there's no point in tracking frequencies of words if you don't know what it actually signifies. So from what I've looked into so far, I think there is definitely a shift as you move further through the editions. So I'm looking forward to getting into that data a little bit more. So network, sorry, there's a fly. Network analysis is an aspect of the research I haven't dug into too much at this point, um, but it's something I'm very excited about. So what I'm hoping to do is map which articles are related to each other um, by the editors of the encyclopedia or the authors. So this takes the form in the CX phrasing where one article will redirect to another one, telling you where you should then go on to look at more sources of information. Um, so here, the examples, slave directs to slavery, and within the body of slavery article, the reader is directed to moral philosophy. So you can see how these networks start to evolve. So this is a very big, this is why you need to do some network analysis and create some maps um, to get some good visuals. But this is a sort of structural breakdown of moving from slave to slavery to the other items that are mentioned um, in the slavery article. So in following these multiple strands of methods to pick out key themes and language from the EB relating to slavery, I'm hoping to construct a diachronic narrative of the development of representations of race and slavery 
through the pages and editions of EB. It goes beyond the surface level of information that we would decipher manually, for example, looking at the slavery article or looking at cotton. It lets you pick out so much more information from the wider text, which is incredibly valuable and to date is something that's quite difficult to do without the assistance of digital research methods. So there's a huge wealth of discoveries to be made. Um, and digital methods have made this possible, not only in the generation of a large scale um, usable data set, but also in the variety of ways that I can sort of tease the information out and dig deeper into the information that we don't expect to see across the articles. Thank you very much. <laughs>